Chapter Twelve of the Legends and Myths of Hawaii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Legends and Myths of Hawaii by King David Kalakaua. Chapter Twelve: The Sacred Spear Point. Characters: Kakae and Kakaalaneo joint moas of maui kahekili son of kakae kaululaau son of kakalaneo waolani a high priest of maui kalona iki king of oahu leia aiwa sister of the queen of oahu kamakaua a companion of kaululaau Kaholanu, Mahu, King of Hawaii. Neula, Queen of Hawaii. Noakua, a chief of Kohala, Hawaii. Pele, goddess of Kilauea. Keuakepo, brother of Pele. Mualeo, a gnome god of Molokai. Pueoli, a winged demon of Oahu. The Sacred Spear Point. The Adventures of Kaulu Laau, Prince of Maui. 1. Kaulu Laau was one of the sons of Kakaa Laneo, brother of and joint ruler with Kake in the government of Maui. The latter was the legitimate heir to the Moi ship, but as he was weak minded, Kakaa Laneo ruled jointly with him and was the real sovereign of the little kingdom. The court of the brothers was at Lele now Lahaina, and was one of the most distinguished in the group. The mother of Kaululau was Kanekekanalula, of the family of Kamauaua, king of Molokai, through his son Haili, who was the brother or half-brother of Keoloa and Kaupepe. The latter, it will be remembered, was the abductor of the celebrated Hina of Hawaii, and the family was of the old strain of Maweki. Kaululaau was probably born somewhere between the years 1390 and 1400. He had a half-sister, whose name was Wau, and a half-brother, Kahiliwalua, who was the father of Luaya, who became the husband of a daughter of Piliwali, Moi of Oahu, and brother of Lolale. He doubtless had other brothers and sisters, since his father was blessed with two or more wives, but the legends fail to refer to them. Kahekili, son of Kake, and who becomes his successor in the Moi ship, was of near the age of his cousin Kaulu Laau, and the two princes grew to manhood together. They were instructed by the same teachers, schooled in the same arts and chiefly accomplishments, and chanted the same genealogical meles yet in disposition and personal appearance they were widely different. From his youth Kahekili was staid, sober, and thoughtful. Bred to the knowledge that he would succeed his father as Moai of the island, he began early in life to prepare himself for the proper exercise of supreme authority, and at the age of twenty was noted for his intelligence, dignity, and royal bearing. He had been told by a prophet that one of his name would be the last independent king of Maui, and the information rendered him solicitous for his future and drove many a smile from his lips. Yet, with all his austerity and circumspection, he was kind-hearted and affectionate, and his pastimes were such as comported with his dignity. In height he was somewhat below the chiefly medium, and his features were rugged and of a Papuan cast, but all knew that he was royal in heart and thought, and the respect due to him was not withheld. Kaulu Laau was unlike his royal cousin in almost every respect. He was noted alike for his intelligence, his manly beauty, and his rollicking spirit of mischief and merriment. He did not covet the scepter. He thought more of a wild debauch, with music, dancing, and a calabash of awa, than the right to command downward or upward the face, and since Kahekili was the designated successor of his father, he claimed the right, as a favored and taboo subject of the realm, to enjoy himself in such manner as best accorded with his tastes. As he could not make laws, he found a pleasure in breaking them. He was neither wantonly cruel nor malignant, but recklessly wild and mischievous, and neither the reproofs of his father nor the mild persuasions of his cousin were sufficient to restrain him. 
his bantering reply to the latter was when you become king i will act with more propriety two mois can afford one wild prince he had a congenial following of companions and retainers who assisted him in his schemes of mischief with feasting and hula dancing he would keep the village in an uproar for a dozen consecutive nights he would send canoes adrift open the gates of fish ponds remove the supports of houses and paint swine black to deceive the sacrificial priests he devised an instrument to imitate the death-warning notes of the alei and frighten people by sounding it near their doors and to others he caused information to be conveyed that they were being prayed to death notwithstanding these misdemeanors kaolua luau was popular with the people since the chiefs or members of the royal household were usually the victims of his mischievous freaks he was encouraged in his disposition to qualify himself for the priesthood under the instruction of the eminent high priest and prophet waolani and had made substantial advances in the calling when he was banished to the island of lanai by his royal father for an offence which could neither be overlooked nor forgiven at that time lanai was infested with a number of gnomes monsters and evil spirits among them the gigantic mu moaleu they ravaged fields uprooted coconut trees destroyed the walls of fish ponds and otherwise frightened and discomfited the inhabitants of the island that his residence there might be made endurable kaulu laau was instructed by the kalus and sorcerers of the court in many charms spells prayers and incantations with which to resist the powers of the supernatural monsters when informed of these exercising agencies by kaulua luau his friend the venerable high priest waolani told him that they would avail him nothing against the more powerful and malignant of the demons of lanai disheartened at the declaration kaulu laau was about to leave the heiau to embark for lanai when wolani after some hesitation stayed his departure and entering the inner temple soon returned with a small roll of kapa in his hand slowly uncording and removing many folds of cloth an ivory spear point a span in length was finally brought to view holding it before the prince he said take this it will serve you in any way you may require its powers are greater than those of any god inhabiting the earth it has been dipped in the waters of po and many generations ago was left by lono upon one of his altars for the protection of a temple menaced by a mighty fish god who found a retreat beneath it in a great cavern connected with the sea draw a line with it and nothing can pass the mark affix it to a spear and throw it and it will reach the object no matter how far distant much more will it do but let what i have said suffice the prince eagerly reached to possess the treasure but the priest withdrew it and continued i give it to you on condition that it pass from you to no other hands than mine and then if i am no longer living when you return to maui as you some day will you will secretly deposit it with my bones swear to this in the name of lono kaulu laau solemnly pronounced the required oath the priest then handed him the talisman wrapped in the kapa from which it had been taken and he left to the temple and immediately embarked with a number of his attendants for lanai reaching lanai he established his household on the south side of the island learning his name and rank the people treated him with great respect for lanai was then a dependency of maui assisted in the construction of the houses necessary for his accommodation and provided him with fish poi fruits and potatoes in great abundance in return for this devotion he set about ridding the island of the supernatural pests with which it had been for years afflicted in the legend of kalea the surf rider of maui will be found some reference to the battles of kaula luau with the evil spirits and monsters of lanai his most stubborn conflict was with the gnome god mualeo he imprisoned the demon within the earth by drawing a line around him with a sacred spear point and subsequently released and drove him into the sea more than a year was spent by kaulu laau in quieting and expelling from the island the malicious monsters that troubled it but he succeeded in the end in completely relieving the people from their vexatious visitations this added immeasurably to his popularity and the choicest of the products of the land and sea were laid at his feet his triumph over the demons of lanai was soon known on the other islands of the group and when it reached the ears of kakaaleneo he dispatched a messenger to his son offering his forgiveness and recalling him from exile the service he had rendered was important and his royal father was anxious to recognize it by restoring him to favor but kaulu luau showed no haste in availing himself of his father's magnanimity far from the restraints of the court he had become attached to the independent life he had found in exile 
and could think of no comforts or enjoyments unattainable on lanai the women there were as handsome as elsewhere the bananas were as sweet the coconuts were large the awa was as stimulating and the fisheries were as varied and abundant in product he had congenial companionship and bands of musicians and dancers at his call the best of the earth and the love of the people were his and the apapani sang in the grove that shaded his door what more could he ask what more could he expect should he return to maui his exile had ceased to be a punishment and his father's message of recall was scarcely deemed a favor however kaulu laau returned a respectful answer by his father's messenger thanking kakaleneo for his clemency and announcing that he would return to maui some time in the near future after having visited some of the other islands of the group and three months later he began to prepare for a trip to hawaii he procured a large double canoe which he painted royal yellow and had fabricated a number of cloaks and capes of the feathers of the u and mamo at the prow of his canoe he mounted a carved image of lono and at the top of one of the masts a place was reserved for the proud tabu standard of an aha ali'i this done with a proper retinue he set sail for hawaii two on his visit to hawaii kaulu laau was accompanied by a number of companions of his own disposition and temperament among them was kamakuau a young maui chief who had followed him into exile and was thoroughly devoted to his interests he was brave courtly and intelligent and in personal appearance somewhat resembled the prince the crew and most of the attendants of the prince had been selected by kamakuau including the chief navigator and astrologer and however competent they may have been in their respective stations it was discovered during the voyage that they were no less efficient as musicians and dancers hence there was no lack of amusement as the huge double canoe breasted the waves of the alenuihaha channel and on the morning of the third day stood off the village of waipio in the district of hamakua hawaii at that time kohalunui mahu father of the noted kiha was king of hawaii his wife was neula a chiefess of maui who had inherited very considerable possessions in the neighborhood of honolulu on that island as the climate of the locality was salubrious and the neighboring waters abounded abundantly in fish the royal couple made frequent and sometimes lengthy visits thither these visits were usually made without the knowledge of kakalaneo and the unexplained attachment of the hawaiian king to the comparatively small inheritance of his wife on a neighboring island began to be regarded with suspicion and had become a theme for speculation and inquiry at the court of lahaina at the time of the visit of kaula luau to wapio kahulunaui had been absent for some months on maui leaving neula in charge of the government of hawaii attributing the absence of the king to deliberate neglect neula had become greatly dissatisfied and whispers of coming trouble were rife throughout the island all this was doubtless known to kaula luau and as the royal residence was at waipio it was upon the beach below that he landed with his party and drew up his double canoe the presence and state of the strangers were soon heralded to the queen and she promptly dispatched messengers courteously inviting the prince and his personal retainers to become her guests at the royal halle at the same time giving orders for the accommodation of the humbler of his attendants and followers as was the hospitable custom of the time accepting the invitation kaulu laau and four of his chiefly companions were provided with quarters within the palace enclosure and their food was served from the royal table in the afternoons kaulu laau was accorded an audience with the queen during which he presented his friends including kamakua the prince whiled away nearly a month at waipio and many formal entertainments were given in his honor neula was unusually agreeable and was soon on terms of friendly intimacy with both the prince and kamakaua this was exactly what kaula laau desired since it enabled him to devise and assist in the execution of a scheme for bringing the king back from maui and keeping him thereafter within his own kingdom under the instructions of kaula luau kamakua assumed to be greatly smitten with the charms of the queen as she was a comely woman and somewhat vain of her personal appearance the conquest of the handsome chief gratified her but his attentions developed the fact that he had a rival in nokua a chief of kohala this discovery simplified the plans of the prince and relieved kamakaua of a dangerous duty in the end 
in pressing his suit he found a pretext for informing the queen that the continued absence of the king was due to the fact that he had taken another wife with whom he was living at honolulu and that he had ceased to care either for his kingdom or his family while kamakaua was pouring this poison into the ears of neula kaula luau who had made the acquaintance of noakua was planting in the mind of the chief the seeds of sedition he flattered him with the opinion that he was made to rule and by degrees developed to him a plan through which with the favor of the queen he could seize the government unite the principal chiefs in his support and prevent kauhulani from returning to hawaii the ambition of noakua and the anger of the queen at the presumed neglect and infidelity of her husband soon harmonized them in a plot against the absent king preparations for the revolt began to be observed and when kaulu luau not wishing to be openly identified with the dangerous movement quietly embarked with his party for hilo where he remained to watch the progress of the struggle which he had been instrumental in originating the prince had been in hilo but a few days when a lunapai arrived from wapio summoning the chief of the district to repair thither with eight hundred warriors and announcing the assumption of the sovereignty of the island by neula similar notifications were sent to the chiefs of the other districts of the kingdom and soon all was excitement from kau to kohala hearing of the revolt kaholanui who had been engaged in constructing a fish pond at kionioyo in the neighborhood of honolulu left maui at once with less than a hundred spears and landing in kona whose chief could be relied upon he started overland for waipio the revolution was unpopular and with great unanimity the chiefs and people rallied to the standard of the king the struggle was brief a battle was fought near waimea resulting in the defeat of the rebel army and the death of noakua this ended the revolt as a punishment to neula the king took another wife but the object of kaula laau was accomplished for kahulani never again visited maui although the queen spent much of her time hereafter at honolulu where her favorite guest and friend was kamakaua leaving hilo kaula luau and his party leisurely drifted along the coast of puna till they reached the borders of kau when they landed at keauhu to spend a few days in fishing and surf riding weary of the sport kaula laua left the bathers in the surf one afternoon and threw himself under the shade of a hala tree near the shore watching the clouds and the sea birds circling in the heavens above him he fell asleep and when he awoke his eyes fell upon a beautiful woman sitting upon a rock not more than a hundred paces distant and silently watching the swimmers as they came riding in on the crests of the rollers her skirts were a powell spangled with crystals and over her shoulders hung a short mantle of the colors of a rainbow her long hair was held back by a lay of flowers and her wrists and ankles were adorned with circlets of tiny shells of pink and white the appearance of the woman dazzled him and after gazing for some time and rubbing his eyes to be sure that he was not dreaming he rose to his feet and approached the radiant being advancing within four or five paces of the woman apparently unobserved he stopped and with a cough attracted her attention turning her face toward him he greeted her courteously and requested permission to approach nearer and converse with him her appearance indicated that she was a person of rank and he did not feel like trespassing uninvited upon her privacy she did not deign to make any reply to his request but after scanning him from head to foot turned her face toward the sea again with a contemptuous toss of the head he hesitated for a moment and then turned and strode rapidly down to the beach where his double canoe had been safely drawn up on the sands in the guise of a bather thought the prince she evidently mistakes me for a servant i will approach her in the garb to which my rank entitles me and see what effect that will have entering the canoe he girded his loins with a gaudy maro hung round his neck a paloa and threw over his shoulders a royal mantle of yellow feathers then crowning his head with a brilliant feather helmet he selected a spear of the length of six paces and stepped from the canoe as he did so he stumbled this means that i have forgotten or omitted something of importance said the prince to himself stopping and in detail scanning his equipments at that moment a lizard ran across his path and entered a hole in the earth this brought to mind his battle with a gigantic gnome on lanay and with a smile he re-entered the canoe taking from a calabash where it had been for months secreted the charmed spear-point of lono he affixed it firmly to the point of a javelin and thus equipped again sought the presence of the fascinating being by whom he had been repulsed advancing as before he once more craved permission to approach near enough to drink in the beauty of her eyes but she seemed to be in no mood to consent 
scanning him in his changed apparel with an air of indifference she said you need not have taken the trouble to bedeck yourself with royal feathers i knew you before as i know you now to be kaula laau son of kakalaneo moi of maui i do not desire your company since you know who i am i must claim the right to insist upon my request unless you can show indeed that you are of equal or better rank saying this the prince took a step forward then come replied the woman since you are rude enough to attempt it sit at my feet and tell me of your love and i will search the caves for squid and beat the kappa for you the prince advanced joyfully and was about to seat himself at the feet of the lovely being when with a cry he sprang back the rock he had touched was as hot as if it had just been thrown from the crater of a volcano come said the woman tauntingly do you not see that i am waiting for you again the prince advanced but the earth for two or three paces around her was glimmering with heat and he hastily withdrew to where the ground and rocks were cool he was now satisfied that he was dealing with someone wielding supernatural powers and resolved to test the efficacy of the charmed point of his javelin why do you not come continued the woman in a tone of mingled defiance and reproach because the earth where you are sitting is too warm for my feet replied the prince innocently come where i am standing and i will sit beside you and with the point of his javelin he marked upon the ground the boundaries of a space around him retire some paces and i will do so replied the woman confidently the prince withdrew as requested and she quietly removed to the spot where he had been standing now come said the woman reseating herself perhaps you will find it cooler here i hope so returned the prince as he began cautiously to advance he crossed the line marked by the point of his javelin and felt no heat he took three more steps forward and the earth was still cool another step which brought him within two paces of the enchantress convinced him that her powers were impotent within the boundaries of the line he had drawn and with a sudden leap forward he caught her in his arms astounded at the failure of her powers and humiliated at her defeat the woman struggled to free herself from the embrace of the prince but within the charmed circle she possessed but the strength of a simple woman and was compelled to yield to the supreme indignities of superior force exasperated beyond measure she at length succeeded in eluding his grasp and springing beyond the fatal line the prince followed but she was now herself and he could neither overtake nor restrain her retreating some distance up the hill she suddenly stopped and awaited his approach she permitted him to advance within forty or fifty paces of her when in the space of a breath she abandoned her captivating disguise and stood forth in the form of pele the dreadful goddess of kilauea her eyes were bright as the midday sun and her hair was like a flame of fire the prince stopped in dismay the goddess raised her hand and at her feet burst forth a stream of molten lava rolling fiercely down upon the prince as if to engulf him he started to escape by flight but the stream widened and increased in speed as it followed fearful that it would overtake him before he could reach the sea he thought of his javelin and with the point hastily drew a line in front of the advancing flood continuing his flight and looking back he discovered to his great relief that the stream had stopped abruptly at the line he had drawn and could not pass it passing into a ravine the angry flow sought to reach the sea through its channel and thus cut off the retreat of the prince but he crossed the depression marking a line as he went and the fiery avalanche was stayed at the limit observing that she was thwarted by some power whose element seemed to be of the earth pele summoned her brother keakepo from kilauea and a shower of fire and ashes descended on kaula laau and his companions leaping into the sea to avoid the fire they dragged the double canoe from its moorings and swimming and pushing it through the breakers escaped from the coast with but little injury three having embroiled himself with the divine and political powers of hawaii kaula laau rounded the southern point of lale and set sail for molokai he spent a month on that island with the royal relatives of his mother by whom he was appropriately received and entertained he visited the home of laa mau mau the wind god the poisoned grove of kale pahoa and the demolished fortress on the promontory of haupu where the gallant kaupepe of whose blood he was met his dramatic death he then set sail for oahu the island of oahu was at that period one of the most prosperous in the group it was under the government of kalona iki one of the two sons of malaiku kahi 
who during his reign had instituted a code of laws giving better protection to the poor making theft punishable with death and claiming as the wards of the government the first-born male children of all families without regard to rank or condition Colonna continued the peaceful and intelligent policy of his father and his court was noted alike for the brilliancy of its chiefs and the beauty of its women his principal place of residence was waikiki although he had sumptuous temporary resorts at ua and wailua kaula laau first touched at wailua but learning that the king was at waikiki he ordered his canoe to proceed around to the south side of the island in charge of his chief navigator while he and kamakau concluded to make the journey overland dispensing with all insignia of rank inhabited like simple commoners the prince and his companion started unattended for waikiki both were armed with javelins but the one borne by kaula laau was tipped with the charmed point of lanon proceeding along the foot of the kaala range of mountains in the afternoon they sat down to rest in the shade of a hala tree in a ravine below them five or six men were working and scattered along its banks were a number of huts soon a tumult of screams reached them and men women and children were seen running hither and thither in a state of great excitement the travellers sprang to their feet and as they did so a gigantic bird swept immediately over their heads and winged its way toward the hills it passed so closely that the branches of the hala tree were swayed by the motion of its mighty pinions and its outspread wings seemed to measure scarcely less than twenty long steps from tip to tip while watching the monster with amazement a woman approached and to the questions of the prince replied between wails of anguish that the great bird the peo alii as she called it had just killed her only child in front of her hut with a stab to the heart resembling the cut of a knife she hurriedly gave the additional information that for many years past the same bird had at intervals visited different districts of the island killing children pigs and fowls and that the priest had declared it to be a pueo or owl sacred to the gods and which could not therefore be molested with safety even if harm to it were possible from human hands better learned in the inspiration and purposes of such visitations since he had been instructed by the eminent high priest waolani and having had many conflicts with malignant spirits he doubted that the monster he had just seen was of the sacred pueo family and requested that he be shown the dead child proceeding to the hut and inspecting the wound he observed that the fatal cut was upward and not downward as it would have been had it been made by the beak of an owl this confirmed him in the correctness of his first impression and requesting kamakaua to follow him he started toward the hills in the direction taken by the bird they could still see it in the distance like a dark cloud against the mountain after following it for some time the bird swooped down to commit some fresh depredation and then rose and alighted upon a rocky ridge with precipitous face sweeping down from the main summit of kaala why go farther said kamakaau we cannot reach the bird and if we could our spears would be like straws to such a monster as if by a strong hand the javelin in the grasp of the prince forcibly turned and pointed toward the bird smiling at the augury kaula laau replied look you carefully back and see if we are followed kamakaau turned his face in compliance and as he did so the prince poised his javelin and hurled it in the direction of the bird in twenty pieces the point did not droop in forty it did not fall to the ground in a hundred a new energy seized it and like a flash of light it sped out of sight a moment later the prince saw the bird sink and disappear i can see no one said kamakaau after carefully scanning the ground over which they had passed nor can i now see the bird he continued looking toward the ridge where can it be at the foot of the cliff replied the prince with the point of my javelin in his heart having been with the prince on molokai kamakaau received the strange information without question or great wonder and hastening to the base of the precipice they found the monster dead with the javelin buried in its breast removing the weapon they cut off the head and one of the feet of the bird pulled from its wings four of the longest feathers and with them returned to the hala tree under which they had found shelter from the sun the burden taxed their strength to the utmost the weight of the head which was borne by the prince was scarcely less than that of his own body while the feathers were seven paces in length and the claws two paces between their extreme points great excitement followed the spreading of the news that pueo ali'i had been killed by strangers these sufferers through its visitations were disposed to commend the act and others condemned it as an insult to the gods which would probably bring broadcast calamity upon the whole island 
to placate the anger of the gods it was proposed to sacrifice the strangers at the nearest hiau and respectfully wrapping the head of the bird in kapa kaula laau and his companion were conducted with their trophies to the sacred temple of kunkaniloko which was not far distant they were accompanied by a crowd which constantly swelled in numbers as they proceeded and on arriving at the heiau they were surrounded by four or five hundred men and women many of them armed and clamoring for their blood kaula laau was in no wise alarmed but rather enjoyed the situation the high priest of the temple appeared and the matter was laid before him looking at the foot and mighty feathers of the bird he turned to the strangers and said you have slain a creature sacred to the gods and my thought is that you should be sacrificed to avert their wrath be careful in your judgment priest replied the prince how know you that the bird was sacred for years it has been so regarded returned the priest how know you that it was not does it become the high priest of kukaneloko to ask such a question said the prince but i will reply to it when you answer this with the javelin now in my hand i killed the bird at a distance farther than from where we stand to yonder hills could it have been done by human hand without the especial favor of the gods if not then how have the gods been angered the priest was confounded and when the prince proposed to submit the question of his guilt to the king the suggestion was accepted it now being near nightfall kaulu laau and his companion were removed within the enclosure of the temple for safe keeping and knowing that they would be deprived of their weapons the prince removed the charmed point from his javelin and secreted it in the folds of his morrow early next morning the high priest and his two prisoners who were kept under no marked restraint accompanied by a large concourse of people carrying the head foot and feathers of peulaii started for waikiki everyone seemed to know that the great bird had been killed and many stood by the wayside to see the feathers that had been torn from its wings and to catch a glimpse of its destroyer near the middle of the day the great gathering arrived at waikiki as many carried spears it resembled an army in its march and messengers were dispatched by the king to ascertain its meaning halting near the shores of the harbor and not far from the royal mansion to report the arrival of the prisoners and learn the pleasure of the king the prince observed his double canoe drawn up on the beach and requested permission to approach it that he might secure the counsel of his master kaulu laau son of the moi of maui the favor could not well be denied and under guard of two inferior priests of kukani loko the prince was conducted to the canoe as but three or four of the crew were present and their attention was wholly absorbed in the gathering around the royal halle the prince stepped unobserved by them into the canoe and passed quickly into his private quarters a close wickerwork apartment eight or ten feet in length by the breadth of both canoes and with a height of six feet or more from their bottoms to the top screen hurriedly investing himself with his regalia of rank including helmet feather mantle and spear he stepped into view and sounded a blast upon a shell soon a number of his attendants made their appearance and with such following as befitted a prince he started for the royal mansion the guards who escorted him to the canoe did not recognize him as he left it and after passing the crowd surrounding the palace his name and rank were announced to the king he was promptly met and courteously welcomed at the door by kalona and informed that messengers of greeting and invitation would have been dispatched to him had his presence at waikiki been known kaula laau then apprised the king that he had but just arrived overland from waialua while his double canoe had been sent around to meet him at waikiki and that it was his purpose to spend some days on oahu the hospitalities of the royal halle were then tendered and accepted after which the king explained to his distinguished guest the cause of the large gathering around the palace and invited him to an inspection of the head feathers and claws of the mighty peua alii and to listen to the story of the slayer of the sacred bird should he deem it of sufficient interest kaulu laau accompanied the king to a large dancing pavilion within the royal enclosure to which had been conveyed the severed parts of the gigantic bird after the claws and feathers had been examined with awe and amazement the king ordered the slayer of the bird to be brought before him the high priest of kukaniloko bowed and turned to execute the order when the guards placed over the prince came from the beach with the information that their prisoner had escaped the priest was savage in his disappointment either find him or take his place upon the altar he hissed to the unfortunate guards and then led kamakao before the king with the explanation that the other prisoner had managed to elude the vigilance of his guards but would doubtless soon be found kamakaua discovered the prince at the side of the king and could hardly restrain a smile when questioned he denied that he killed the great bird but admitted that he assisted in removing the head feathers and one of the feet 
this is trifling said the king turning to the priest with a scowl where is the other prisoner he is here great king exclaimed kaululaau bowing before kalona to the astonishment but great relief of the priest favored by the gods i slew the malignant monster your priests call by the sacred name peualii their skill should have instructed them differently will the king favor me by ordering the kapa covering to be removed from the head the order was given and the uncovered head was raised beak upward before the king in a moment it was observed that the head was not of a pueo or owl nor did it bear resemblance in form to that of any bird known it was narrow between the eyes which in color were those of a shark and its long and pointed beak both of the upper and under jaws turned sharply upward it is not a pueo was the general exclamation are you satisfied priest inquired the prince i think it is not a pueo responded the priest reluctantly you think it is not a pueo exclaimed the king indignantly do you not know it what pueo ever had such eyes and such a beak the priest hung his head in confusion and the prince having completely discomfited him now came kindly to his relief by remarking the mistake might well have been made for on the wing and at a distance the bird much resembled a pueo you are kind to say so prince said the king but the priests and the kaluas have been greatly at fault for years the bird has preyed upon the people and no one has dared to molest it since you killed it knowing it was not sacred perhaps you may be able to tell me something of its unnatural birth and appetites thus appealed to kaululaau modestly replied if i may rely upon what seemed to be a dream last night the bird was possessed by the spirit of hilo a lakapu one of the chiefs of hawaii who evaded oahu during the reign of your royal father he was slain at waimano and his head was placed upon a pole near Honolulu for the birds to feed upon he was of akua blood and through a bird god relative his spirit was given possession of the monster which the gods enabled me to slay the spirit of hilo had been brought in with the head of the dead bird and with the utterance of these words by the prince the eyes rolled the ponderous jaws opened and closed and with a noise like the scream of an alei the malignant spirit took its departure the truth of the dream of kaula laau thus being verified the king publicly thanked him for ridding the island of the monstrous scourge and ordered a special honors to be paid him by all classes so long as it might be his pleasure to remain in the kingdom in return the prince presented to the king the head claws and feathers of the bird the latter to be made into a mammoth kahili and then made kamakaawa known to him together with such other chiefs in his train as were entitled to royal recognition kaululaau became at once the hero of the court as well as the idol of the people he remained more than a month at oahu enjoying the unstinted hospitality of the king and his district chiefs he was a favorite with the fairest women of the court but he gave his heart to the beautiful laia aua sister of the wife of kalona and with her returned to maui landing at lahaina after his long absence he was joyfully welcomed home by his royal father who had heard of his adventures and fully forgiven the faults of his youth with grief he learned that his friend the high priest waolani had died some months before remembering his oath he found the burial place of the priest and with his remains secretly deposited the sacred spear point of lono which had served him so effectively he devoutly kissed the relic before he hid it forever from view and afterwards knelt and thanked lono and the priest for its use lands were given him in kaulaula where he resided until the end of his days laia was his only wife and they were blessed with six children whose names alone are mentioned by tradition end of chapter twelve